Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we are going to study the basic structure and hardware of a magnetic resonance imaging machine. What are the specifications for its placement and what are the basic system components? Today we are not going to talk about image reconstruction. We are not going to talk about T1, T2, TETR. This will be the topic for our next lecture inshallah. Now the MR facility basically includes a set of at least four rooms. These rooms are characterized into zones according to the ACR criteria. Zone 1 includes all the areas which are freely accessible to the general public without any supervision. Magnetic fringe field in this area is less than 5 Gauss. Zone 2 includes the waiting and the dressing rooms. It is still a public area but MR safety screening occurs here under supervision of the technologist. Zone 3 includes the operating console room. As it is near the magnet room where the fringe gradient is sufficiently strong to cause a physical hazard to any unscreened patient, so it is a restricted zone. Both in zone 2 and 3, the magnetic fringe can reach up to 5 gauze. Zone 4 includes the MR magnet room itself. The magnetic fringe here can reach up to 30 gauze. The room has to be a minimum of 50 square feet in area. In order to prevent external radio frequency interference, it has to be enclosed in a mesh of shielding in the form of a Faraday's cage. The three main types of shieldings used for MRI rooms are copper, steel and aluminum. However, copper is generally considered the best shielding for MR rooms. The external wall of the MRI room is removable to facilitate the installation of the MR machine. The door is made up of a special niobium aluminum alloy. It has a special lock which can be opened from inside at all the times. A metal detector is placed just outside the door. A glass window is present between the operator's room and the MR room which can be broken in the cases of emergency. All rooms contain an oxygen monitor. A helium leak would displace the oxygen in the room, suffocating anyone inside. Because helium is a colorless and odorless gas, an oxygen deficiency monitor is required for detection of oxygen depletion. Its control is installed near the operator's console. All the rooms also contain a gas ventilating system. Once again, if any helium evaporates, the temperature of the liquid helium being hundreds of degrees below the freezing point is cold enough to freeze any human tissue within seconds. During circulation around the magnet, Helium evaporates into odorless and colorless gases. Most of the gas is recaptured and condensed by the cool head. But some gas escapes during the process. The escaped gas has to be vented out of the building through the special gas ventilating system. Any cables going in and out of the MR room must pass through a penetration panel. The panel contains waveguides and filters required to provide communication between the inside and outside of the scanner room. If any electrical cable is found passing through the panel without filtering, it should be removed. Otherwise, the radio frequency interference may occur, causing slight to severe imaging artifacts. The room should also contain a contrast injector, a few cabinets to store the surface coils and the body linen, a non-metallic emergency tray in the case of a contrast reaction. Now, the most important thing in an MR room is basically the gantry and the table. In order to understand the basic structure of the gantry, you can look at this image which is showing you two cylinders intertwined in one another. These cylinders are made up of stainless steel casing. The inner cylinder, red in color, has a radio frequency coil, the gradient coils and the shim coil. The outer cylinder is also called the divar or the cryostat, is placed in a vacuum seal along with the thermostat and contains the main magnet immersed within liquid helium. So the layers from inside to the outside are the metal casing, the radio frequency coil, the gradient coils, shim coil, then the vacuum and thermostat, helium, magnet, helium, vacuum once again, and a metal case. This is a picture to make you understand what the cryostat looks from inside. The yellow line is basically depicting the thermostat and the vacuum. The blue is depicting the liquid helium. The red line basically presents the magnet which is immersed in the liquid helium. 
and in the center is a bore where the patient is going to lie down. The cool head over there is basically to facilitate the condensation of any gas which is evaporated during circulation of the helium. The coolant level has to be logged daily. If it falls too low, the temperature will rise, superconductivity will be lost, and stored energy will be released. This phenomena is known as quenching. Now we come to the table. The table performs two functions of support and position. The table should at minimum be able to accept the patients who weigh up to 150 kilograms at near the floor level and raise the patient with the power assist to the level of the gantry. From this position outside the gantry, the table should be capable of moving to the imaging position under power assist to within 1 millimeters. This precision is obtained with speciality gears and electronic registers. Each revolution of the smallest drive gear corresponds to 1 millimeter movement of the couch. Each revolution also activates an electronic counter so that the couch position can be visually displayed. Sitting of the machine has to be on a concrete slab and steel girders. Two or three positioning laser lights are adjusted to intersect on the axis of the primary magnetic field. Now we'll talk about the body coils. There is a radio frequency coil, the gradient coil, shim coil, main magnet and surface coils. The innermost coil is the radio frequency coil which is nearest to the bore of the machine. Itself it has two parts, the inner receiver coil and the outer transmitter coil. The receiver or transmitter coils may be physically separate or same. They produce a magnetic field at right angles to the main field. The frequency of the electromagnetic radiation is between 1 MHz to 10 GHz. They can act as antenna of the radio as they transmit and receive the signals. These radio frequency coils are attached to the RF amplifiers and the main computer. The second layer consists of gradient coils. There are three gradient coils, one for each spatial direction. They are used to produce variation in the magnetic field typically by 20 milliteslas. Z-axis is the gradient used to select the slice thickness. This can be an important MCQ question. These coils consist of two identical circular coils parallel to one another in the form of a Helmholtz coil. The x-axis gradient is used to select the frequency in the field of view and y-axis gradient is used to select the phase of the matrix, both of them MCQ questions. Both x and y-axis gradients are produced by saddle coils. The configuration creates a very linear and homogeneous magnetic field along its central axis. All these coils carry direct current. These coils are connected to the amplifiers which are present in the system component room and these emit the current. These currents have to be switched on and off rapidly in less than one millisecond. It is the movement of these gradient coils that causes the loud banging noise during the scan. The third layer consists of the shim coils. Once again, they carry the direct current. Their function is to make the magnetic field homogeneous and this process is called shimming. These are the names of a few volume body coils being used by the manufacturers according to difference in their physical properties. Circularly polarized coil, quadrature coil, bird cage coil, crossed coil, Helmholtz pair coil, paired saddle coil, single turned solenoid coil. However, I don't think that you have to go into details. Now coming to the main magnet. There are three types of main magnets, superconducting magnets, resistive electromagnets and permanent magnets. Mainly in machines, in MR machines now, superconducting magnets are being used. These are called superconducting magnets because they have the ability to conduct electric current without any resistance. Once the electricity is set in, it continues to flow within that without any stoppage. Diameter of this superconducting magnet is very large, usually 1 meter, and it weighs about 6 tons. They also use electricity in the form of a direct current. The superconducting magnet is made up of a solenoid coil, which is several miles long, and it is tightly packed together. It is embedded in the conductors, which are made of niobium titanium alloy in a copper matrix. This coil is kept immersed in liquid helium to keep its temperature static at 4.2 kelvins. The magnet and the coils are then placed in a divar, which is also known as a cryostat, which is a cylindrical container we talked about earlier in this video. 
The Devar has a cold head immersed in the helium which is attached to the external refrigerator to maintain the temperature of the helium and extend its life to about 3 to 4 years. The cold head continuously pumps and thumps to pressurize any evaporated helium to liquidize it. The second type of magnets are resistive electromagnets or air core magnets. They operate at room temperature using standard conductors such as copper in the shape of a solenoid or Helmholtz spare coil. A solenoid is basically a cylindrical shaped coil of wire. The uniform magnetic field is found inside the coil, especially in the center. These magnets are relatively inexpensive to make but they require a large constant flow of current while magnetized and during imaging. The coil has an electrical resistance that requires cooling of the magnet. The operating costs are high because of the large power requirement of the magnetic coils and the associated cooling system. Permanent magnets are being used in open MRI machines of 0.14 to 0.3 Teslas. They consist of two opposing flat-faced highly magnetized pole pieces fixed to an iron frame. They require no power. They do not shut down. They are used for claustrophobic patients, obese patients, children and for intervention. Now we come to the surface coils. Surface coils are basically a special type of radio frequency coil. It consists of multiple turns of wire, circular or rectangular, enclosed in a plastic material. Surface coils are receiver coils only. They are placed directly on the patient's body area of interest, for example the knee, the head, the lumbar spine, etc. They receive signals effectively from a depth equal to the coil radius, an important MCQ. They have a very small field of view, a small voxel but better resolution. Once again, MCQ, they provide a larger signal but they are less uniform. The common surface coils are phased array coil, body wraparound coil, linearly polarized coil, saddle coil, transmit phased array surface coil or intracavitary coil. Now just a few words about the operating console. We all know that computers are an integral part of the MR system. The radio frequency transmitter and the gradient coils receive signals from the computer. The RF receiver delivers signal to the computer. So the first step is the acquisition of signals from the RF receiver. The second step is the image reconstruction. The pulse sequences are selected at the console and the control unit synchronizes the gradients and the RF pulses. The third step is viewing and post-processing by Fourier transformation. The important system electronics that you must be well versed with are the gradient and radio frequency amplifiers which are placed in a special room in a cabinet, the power supply, a water pump and chiller and a helium pump. This is not what it looks like at all. It is just to show you the components. Now this is a very important slide and I am going to try to make you understand how the system works. The first step is basically done on the operator's console. The operator chooses the pulse sequences. These sequences are encoded in the main computer. The main computer gives command to the RF transmitter through the amplifier. The amplifier basically engages the RF transmitter which is the first layer of the gantry. And the RF frequency changes the direction of the magnet. Once the direction of the magnetic field is changed, signals are produced by the patient's body. These signals are picked up by the radio frequency receiver. The receiver sends these signals to the signal digitizer. The digitizer is connected to the main computer. Once the image is processed, it is shifted to the operator's console from where the radiologist can read it and give a diagnosis. Now just a few lines about some interesting things that I came across. The world's most powerful MRI machine having 11.75 Tesla is being prepared by INUMAC which stands for imaging of neuro diseases using high field MR and contrastophores. Some hospitals even have scanners that can reach 9.4 Teslas to 8.4 Teslas. However, most standard hospitals have 1.5 or 3 Teslas. MR imaging was invented by Paul C. Lauterber in September 1971. 
However, Raymond Damadian was the first one to perform a full body scan of a human being in 1977. I just came to know that sitting MR machines have also been introduced. Well, let's see what the future holds for us. Thank you.